Welcome to the Fido Alliance webinar series. This webinar will be recorded and available along with the slides and our other webinars on the FidoAlliance.org website. Attendees will be in listen-only mode. A Q&A session will follow the presentations. Enter your questions at any time during the presentation in the chat box in the GoToWebinar interface. Today's webinar will explore the exciting new project from NIST National Cybersecurity of Excellence, also known as NCCOE. Working in conjunction with the industry subject matter experts and stakeholders, including members of the FIDO Alliance, the NCCOE has launched a mobile application single sign-on project that integrates FIDO authentication for public safety and first responder personnel. To explore this new project, we are joined by Bill Fisher of NCCOE and Jeremy Grant of Venable. Jeremy, over to you. Hey, thanks, Tasha, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, so for today's webinar, uh, I've been asked to spend a few minutes uh, giving an introduction to the FIDO Alliance. Uh, as background, I'm Jeremy Grant. I'm Managing Director of Technology Business Strategy at Venable. Uh, we're a law firm in Washington, D.C. with the, the country's largest cybersecurity and privacy practice. Uh, previously, I, I spent a few years uh, uh, in U.S. government running the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, or NSIC as it's known. I had the chance to get to know our other guest speaker today, Bill Fisher, who was a colleague of mine in government. Uh, and uh, Fido asked me today to uh, come in, given the government focus of this, and, and provide a bit of um, some introductory remarks to explain what the Fido Alliance is and some of its history and where it goes. Uh, from there, we'll go to Bill, who will talk more about the specific projects that the NCCOE has been working on. So for starters, you know, I wanted to give some opening thoughts because I'm somebody who's you know, been in and around the, the identity uh, space for uh, a good 20 plus years now uh, and, and came up through the, the smart card and PKI world, uh, you know, starting with efforts in the late 90s through the legislative process to actually get the Defense Department to merge those two technologies together. And for many years when we were talking about access control for first responders, we were focusing on smart cards and PKI. I think a lot of people Remember, you know, good government efforts in partnership with state and local governments around the first responder access card, which was one model uh, that was in fact in many cases today still being used uh, for uh, delivering secure access for first responders, uh, both to applications as well as to uh, different sites where they might be responding. And you know, the old days, you know, of issuing cards it required some some work. Uh, I think one trend that you should, you know, come away with this webinar from today uh, is that strong authentication is getting easier. So in, in the days when we were building some of these systems, you know, we'd have to issue a card uh, and tie that card to certificate authority separately. Uh, then if you wanted to use the card in the device, you'd have to get a separate reader. Uh, if you wanted to try a biometric, that could involve another reader or perhaps an integrated reader with a smart card reader like the one you see at the bottom of the page. Uh, or for alternatives where you couldn't use the card, you might use a one-time password token. All of these things basically meant that somebody who was using these solutions uh, had to carry a whole bunch of, of different things with them, uh, which um, you know would create some issues depending on the use case. So I think what's interesting in the market today, looking at where we are in 2017, is what once required all of these different devices and peripherals tied to something now shifts out of the box today in pretty much every device you get these days, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop, and really regardless of the operating system or manufacturer of the device. And these things are pretty interesting that we use today. They have a couple common elements in, uh, in common. Uh, one is the use of secure, hardware-based, isolated execution environments. That's a bit of a mouthful, but think of the, the TPM, uh, Trusted Platform Module Chips, in, in Windows machines, uh, trusted execution environments, and Android devices or the secure enclave in Apple devices. These are all things that are capable of generating, securing, and applying uh, cryptographic key pairs. And the second is that every device these days, uh, or almost every device, comes with multiple biometric sensors, a fingerprint sensor, a camera that can be used for face and sometimes iris, a microphone that can be used for voice recognition. So together, what this means is most devices that are now in the marketplace today that you know, consumers and enterprises are buying off the shelf are coming with all of the primitives that they need to deliver strong multi-factor authentication right in the device itself. And the role of the FIDO Alliance is it's the organization that is bringing together different stakeholders from across industry, regardless of company, regardless of uh, hardware or software being used, regardless of operating systems, uh, to deliver uh, a consistent approach to strong multi-factor authentication across every one of these devices and operating systems. 
So authentication, um, you know, this is the issue FIDO was, was formed to, create, uh, to solve, has really become one of our biggest problems in cybersecurity today. It's, it's hard to, you know, go a month without news of another big breach where either a password was used to compromise uh, the data in question or what was stolen. Uh, in many cases, where uh, combinations of usernames and passwords themselves that are then used by uh, criminals and other adversaries to uh, try and get into other sites. And, you know, the problem's actually been getting, uh, the problem's been bad and has been getting worse. So, you know, last year, uh, the Verizon 2017 data breach reports uh, showed that 81% of breaches, uh, of hacking breaches, involved the use of weak default or stolen passwords, which is really a pretty stunning number. It means it's an anomaly these days when a major breach happens and a password doesn't provide the, uh, the vector of attack. Uh, with that, um, you know, one thing we've seen is how do adversaries, you know, try to steal passwords? Well, phishing attacks have been the most common. If they can trick you into entering even the most complex password, uh, then it defeats whatever security you might have by a complex password. I'd argue that there isn't any such thing as a, a secure password in 2017. And we're certain seeing, certainly seeing this with a 65% increase in phishing attacks year over year, as well as a 40% increase in the number of breaches uh, year over year. Uh, the situation has not been, been great. So FIDO Alliance is an interesting entity. It's you know, a, a nonprofit organization focusing on developing standards to actually address this issue. And you know, today it has more than 250 members. The logos you see here represent just the 35 members of the FIDO board. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty diverse array of companies uh, from really a, a number of different sectors of the marketplace, uh, you know, starting with, you know, firms like Google and Microsoft, uh, often rivals, but here working together side by side, uh, firms in uh, uh, financial services like Bank of America and USAA, all three major payment card networks, uh, PayPal and others, you know, focusing on alternative ways to pay, handset manufacturers like Samsung and Lenovo, uh, chip manufacturers like Arm and Infineon, uh, Qualcomm and Intel and NXP, and a whole bunch of other specialty providers focusing on the delivering security solutions uh, you know, to the marketplace. So, and that's, you know, by the way, just the board members, you also have sponsor members, associate members, other organizations that FIDO liaises with. Uh, it's really an entity that's pulled together all the players you would actually want at the table to, to solve this kind of complicated problem. And it's worth noting, you know, FIDOSCOPE, uh, while it's tackling some hard problems, when it looks at the broader uh, set of issues that you're dealing with an identity is limited. FIDO was formed only to focus on authentication. It's not trying to solve single sign-on or federation, although uh, Bill will tell you a little bit today about how FIDO is being used as a key element of that uh, alongside single sign-on and federation protocols to enable uh, easier access for first responders. Uh, likewise, things like user management and physical to digital identity are out. The idea really is how do we replace passwords, which are, I've often said, the worst combination of security and, or bad security and bad usability with something that is stronger, easier to use, uh, and more appropriate to the real risks that we're seeing today in cyberspace. FIDO's mission has been really simple. Let's get rid of the trade-off that we've seen with what I would say many first-generation authentication solutions between security and usability, uh, and instead, uh, be able to deliver solutions that are both very secure and very easy to use. The F in FIDO stands for fast, and that was something that the architects of the, of the uh, standards really focused on from the beginning. How do you make this fast and easy for everybody to use? And on the security side, we're focusing on using open standards uh, for simpler, stronger, stronger authentication using public key cryptography, which we've known for some time is, from a security standpoint, the single best solution we have out there due to the fact that it's very hard to break, and it is, uh, when implemented properly, unfishable. Uh, not to be clear, FIDO is not PKI. When we say public key crypto, the easiest way to think about what the FIDO standards are are a lightweight version of PKI that give you many of the benefits of that without some of the additional costs and overhead. Uh, the deployment of it has been uh, pretty significant. Today, FIDO has now been deployed by, you can see some of the, the major brands here that are using it to protect uh, their accounts. Uh, it's a pretty large number in terms of what's actually available today where it's deployed. More than 3 billion accounts worldwide can now be protected with FIDO. And any of you who might be customers of many of the companies on the screen today uh, are able to uh, uh, easily leverage uh, the standards-based solution to authenticate into multiple accounts with a single solution. 
one of the things that's been enabling this has been the rapid growth in companies going out there to get their uh, products certified. And I should note, it's not just standalone security products. In many cases, it's the devices themselves. Uh, it's been a pretty uh, spectacular uh, acceleration uh, with the FIDO certification over the last couple of years. Uh, we've gone from where certification was just launched uh, about two and a half years ago uh, to now having uh, nearly 400 FIDO certified products. Uh, and that is making it very easy for implementers in the marketplace to know that there's a pretty wide uh, array of solutions that have already built this in, uh, so they don't have to worry about whether an application or a device can use FIDO uh, when it's you know, being used for, for applications. So you know, in summary, I'd say FIDO delivers on key priorities in authentication. Uh, it's very secure, it's at high usability. Uh, we haven't talked about it much today, but the way it's architected is done in a way that actually uh, is great for privacy. And because it's based on open standards that are available for anybody to implement, it ensures interoperability across devices and operating systems, uh, which is really key in terms of lowering the cost of deployment and well, as well as also uh, making it much easier uh, for different uh, deployers to be able to uh, trust the solution. So with that, we'll have more time to talk about what FIDO is uh, during the Q&A session. But at this point, I want to hand uh, things over to my colleague, Bill Fisher who now will talk to you about uh, some of the work that's been done at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. So, Bill, on to you. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Everybody should be able to uh, see my slide deck at this point in time. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Bill Fisher. I am one of the security engineers at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence underneath uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm based out of Rockville, Maryland here for all those who may be in the uh, DC area. Uh, and I wanna show you a, uh, talk to you about a project that we're calling Mobile Application Single Sign-On for Public Safety and First Responders. Uh, so just to give everybody a quick overview of the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, or the NCCOE as I'll refer to ourselves, um, I'm sure not everybody on this call is familiar with us. We are uh, a government uh, entity, and our job is to work with industry to help them tackle their cybersecurity challenges. Um, if you are familiar with uh, NIST, which I think many people probably are, you're probably familiar with the great standards and best practices that NIST authors and develops, um, almost always in collaboration with industry. Um, but there's often the question of, man, NIST, you put out a bunch of great content that tells us what we should be doing, but the devil is always in the details and we need help with how we should be doing it. Um, so the NCCOE is actually part of what's called the Applied Cybersecurity Division at NIST. And um, our goal or our mission here is to uh, help accelerate the adoption of secure technologies. And uh, we do that by collaborating with innovators um, to help provide real world and standards based cybersecurity capabilities that address uh, business needs. So uh, the project we'll talk, I'll be talking about today is a project that was brought to us by the public safety first, res first responder community. They came to us with this challenge. Uh, I do want to say that this project has been done uh, in collaboration with another entity at NIST called the Public Safety Communications Research Lab. Uh, PSCR, as they're commonly referred to, they have a very large presence in the public safety community. Um, and so they were a key stakeholder in helping us engage this community and uh, also helping us define requirements and are a co-champion for this effort. Uh, so uh, just a quick intro to the challenge. So what did uh, public safety come to us with, right? You already heard some of the authentication challenges that Jeremy just talked about, and you'll hear some of the same story uh, that's echoing the same sentiments from myself. Um, so the bottom line is uh, that public safety first responders are adopting mobile platforms. And in this case, when I talk about mobile platforms, I'm referring mostly to to Android and iOS platforms, uh, mainly because these platforms offer a significant operational advantage uh, when they're in the line of duty. Uh, and as they adopt those platforms, they adopt more and more mobile applications to do their job. And oftentimes those mobile applications require them to get access to maybe law enforcement sensitive information, maybe protected health information if you're, uh, if you're in the uh, EMS space, the emerging med emergency medical services space, uh, or perhaps uh, you know, personal identifiable information, right? Criminal histories, addresses, um, uh, uh, driver's licenses, all that type of stuff. So they have a need to access sensitive information uh, on these mobile platforms. And then uh, when they're in an emergency responder scenario, uh, every second may matter 
when it comes to containing that scenario or really doing their job. So uh, there's a need for quick access to the information and there's a need for access to the uh, information that has a real level of sensitivity to it. Um, and so in that case, uh, complex authentication on a mobile device uh, really can hinder a first responder. If they have to spend um, a, any significant amount of time uh, typing in a username and a password on a small touch screen while they're in the line of duty, uh, that, those seconds really matter. So that's the challenge it came to us with. How do we do a um, secure but also usable uh, authentication experience for these mobile devices? Uh, and so the two capabilities that we wanted to demonstrate with this uh, effort uh, were multi-factor authentication. So if you're familiar with the factors of authentication, they're typically referred to as something you have, something you uh, know, and something you are. So a have might be a, a hardware token, like a card. A no would be a password, for instance, and an R would be a biometric. Um, so multi-factor authentication would be any two of those in a single authentication protocol run. Uh, and then we want to provide them sing a single sign-on experience, right? So you authenticate once with that multi-factor authentication, and then you just leverage that initial authentication for all the other apps you want to get into without having the need to re-authenticate. So those were the sort of core capabilities and goals we wanted to bring to public safety for this effort. Um, just to touch on uh, some of the background of, of the solution you're about to see and sort of why an entity like public safety would come to the center, uh, I'll highlight a few of the benefits of, of the reference design that we've built out. Um, one is that, as I said, NIST works highly collaboratively with industry and the center of excellence is no different. Uh, we worked very, very closely with lots of subject matter experts in this space from mobile security to identity and authentication. Um, and in this case, we are working directly with the uh, uh, individuals who authored the standards that we used, right? We're working with the FIDO authors, we're working with um, individuals from the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, all these wonderfully smart people. Uh, and then uh, eventually we actually uh, teamed up with five companies, you'll see here at the bottom, um, our mobile SSO technology uh, vendor build team, and these companies here donated their time and effort, um, engineering time and technology to help us build out the solution I'm going to demonstrate to you today. Um, so one of the key benefits for, uh, for an NCC we build is this massive amount of um, industry collaboration, the knowledge base and the mind hive that comes with that. Uh, additionally, we are NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So standards are at the core of all the work we do. Uh, you can see on the top line here um, uh, some icons for, this, for standards that we've used in this build. This isn't even all the standards, it's a subset, but um, all of these standards were used in this uh, build we've, we're going to show today. Um, and we wanted to really demonstrate for public safety what's available on some of the modern commercially available mobile um, platforms. So in this case, some of the single sign-on technology you're going to see and the standard that exists around single sign-on, that's really only been possible on these mobile platforms since uh, Android 5X and above and since iOS 8X and above. Um, and those, so that's really only the last like two and a half years or so that this technology has been possible. Um, so we really are using some of the latest technology in this space. Um, the last benefit here, and you'll hear me talk a little bit about this, uh, a little bit more about this at the end, is uh, the NCCOE, as with most of this, puts out what we call special publications. And in this case, the NCCOE puts out an SP1800 series guide, which we refer to as a practice guide. So uh, the goal here, the, the way we sort of accomplish our, uh, our mission and in getting uh, industry to adopt good cybersecurity practices, standards of best practices, is by putting out a, uh, a practice guide like this that shows industry how to do it. Um, and so that guidance will include um, all kinds of technical decisions that we made in this build. Um, it will also include technical decisions we didn't make and some of the trade-offs we didn't make. It'll elucidate that for organizations. Uh, we realize that um, every organization's IT infrastructure is a bit different and they may make different decisions or trade-offs. Uh, we will obviously include lots of lessons learned, um, lessons learned from actually rolling up our sleeves and working with the technology and the standards of best practices and building and implementing this. Uh, we will include a full set of build instructions. This is literally like a point and a click and a drag and a drop and show you exactly how you can um, replicate in your own environment what we have done in our lab environment. Uh, and then lastly, we'll include some functional tests, uh, which aren't meant to be completely exhaustive, but are meant to be some nice tests that 
um, any organization that's implementing this build could do to uh, gain a level of confidence that they're gaining the same security characteristics that we are talking about inside the build. Uh, and so uh, just a quick note to say that we, uh, we tackled this project because public safety and first responders came to us with this challenge space. Uh, but there's really nothing in this bill that, uh, would, uh, that couldn't be implemented by any other sector or any organization. Um, we're using iOS and Android. We're using all commercially available standards and best practices. And so any organization that has a challenge of um, securely authenticating to and then getting a good single sign-on experience for their mobile applications uh, could leverage this architecture. Uh, so challenges continued. I want to go a little bit more into uh, some of the challenges that we've seen in this space that we're trying to address with this particular uh, build. Um, so I won't lament too long on the password challenge. Uh, Jeremy did a great job of uh, sort of couching that uh, particular challenge space already. Uh, but just to iterate a little bit on that, uh, complexity, right, uh, long and complex passwords, they're just harder to remember and they're harder to use. Um, if you have followed NIST guidance in the recent 863 version 3 that came out this past June, we are starting to transition away from the idea that long and uh, complex passwords are actually a good idea. And, and, and you know, Jeremy um, it just gave you a very strong uh, stance on that from his perspective. Um, uh, those long, complex passwords, uh, that problem is exasperated when you're on a mobile device, right? We're all familiar with uh, mobile touchscreens. We all know how small they can be. We all know that there's an uppercase keyboard, a lowercase keyboard, a special characters keyboard. You have to switch between the three. Um, that makes these long, complicated passwords that much harder to input. Um, as you begin to use more and more, as public safety begins to use more and more mobile applications, the need to have a username and password for each one of those applications makes this problem even harder. If you have five or ten mobile apps that you're using uh, in any given day for your uh, in the line of duty and you have to remember five or different passwords and put them all in, that's a real usability challenge. Um, and what ends up happening is those passwords, the users just end up reusing those same credentials. So they'll have two or three different applications where they have a similar username and the same password. Um, and so that reuse really adds risk into the system, right? If one system is compromised and one password is fished or one a credential is leaked, then that entity who just obtained that username and password, if it's the same across multiple applications, could then try to get into other applications. Um, and as Jeremy already mentioned, passwords are very easily fished. Um, a secondary challenge here is really for uh, mobile app developers. Um, for those that are in the public safety space, they may be familiar with uh, the new application ecosystem that's being rolled out as part of FirstNet, for instance. There's going to be a whole slew of application developers that are going to be putting out all kinds of great and innovative um, uh, applications that really address core public safety first responder needs. Um, and they should be focusing really on the functionality that addresses their needs and, the, and the, uh, all the um, elements and features that that personnel needs in the line of duty. Um, and it, if we can at all, make it really easy for them to handle authentication. So if authentication is left to the mobile app developer and they sort of have to come up with their own solution, it can be very difficult. Um, they have to come up and figure out, with the figure out the challenge of storing and maintaining uh, credentials securely. You know, Jeremy talked about some of the technology that exists on some of these devices. Um, a lot of developers aren't experts in those technologies. They have to figure out how to use them. Um, and moreover, uh, if a developer is trying to secure such, uh, for instance, a username and a password uh, in software in the mobile app, uh, that's just really a recipe for uh, for disaster. Those mobile applications, if you're just protecting a, so a password in software, it's really hard to do that. And then lastly, and this is true for public safety, but really for all organizations, um, identity and credential management is a challenge, right? If you have separate credentials for each resource that you have to issue and then maintain and revoke, um, there's real costs associated with all of that infrastructure that you have to maintain. Um, it's a burden on your users, but it's a burden on your administrators as well. Uh, one particular uh, metric that a lot of organizations look at is the number of help desk calls, right? So for instance, every time a user forgets their password, they call up the help desk and have it, and, um, have it reset, right? That's a real time and expense incurred by an organization uh, and so the more credentials you have to do that for, the more expenditures you incur. And then, as I mentioned before, that risk of credential reuse, um, it's sort of promulgated by the end user who's trying to just figure out how they can, 
you know, uh, manage all their own credentials, but the risk is really realized by the organization, right? If credential reuse occurs and multiple applications um, are compromised because of that, that risk is actually realized by the organization. So uh, we are attempting to solve that, as I said, with um, uh, multi-factor authentication and single sign-on. So I'm going to show you guys a couple videos here in just a second, uh, but let me give a quick rundown of what you're actually going to see in those videos before I show them to you. Um, so one of the reasons we wanted to have Jeremy uh, sort of go first with the FIDO presentation is because FIDO is the core protocol that we've used uh, to handle multi-factor authentication. And uh, we are actually using both FIDO specifications. We'll show you both in this build. Um, so the first one we'll show you is a FIDO UAF authentication, um, and that uses the biometric modality that Jeremy was referring to. Um, so in our case, we're getting multi-factor authentication in this build through the combination of a, a user's fingerprint, so that's the something you are factor, and a private key that is on that device, and that's the something you have factor. Um, remember that FIDO is actually a, uh, a public key uh, 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 technology, uh, based on public key technology, so it uses public-private key pairs. And then the, uh, the second demo we'll show you is the FIDO U2F, or the Universal Second Factor Authentication Protocol. And there, we're going to demonstrate two factors, one being a something you know factor of a PIN or a password, and the second one being an external um, hardware authenticator. And you can see a little image of that authenticator here on the slide. In this case, we're going to use a YubiKey from Yubico. Um, they are one of the, uh, the, the vendors in the FIDO ecosystem. There are many vendors that will, uh, you can look at and will provide U2F external hardware authenticators. And then lastly here, uh, we are doing single sign-on with a few Motorola applications. Um, and the single sign-on is done in the back end via an Internet Engineering Task Force uh, best current practice um, standard for uh, mobile uh, application single sign-on. Uh, so ideally, in the scenario I'm getting ready to show you, a first responder would authenticate once per day, likely at the beginning of their shift, and then leverage that one strong multi-factor authentication via FIDO for the rest of the applications that they would like to access for the rest of the day. Um, so there, there's obviously uh, some, some subsets of those scenarios, and there's um, technical details we can go into if people want to in the questions to talk about those. But this is an ideal scenario. Um, so reduce the amount of authentications to once per day, and then let everybody get access to the apps they need to do their job. So I am switching over now. Uh, everybody should be able to see a uh, what is a Android screen here. This is an Android device. Um, this architecture works on Android and on iOS. We have it only implemented now on Android. We are working on the iOS implementation. And uh, here what we have is uh, you can see at the top three Motorola applications here. So we have TSX Cockpit, Mapping, and Messenger. Um, and these are all publicly available applications that Motorola provides to public safety personnel. And these already implement the single sign-on standard that I uh, referred to. So what I'm going to show you is uh, we're going to access the Cockpit app, we're going to do multi-factor authentication, and then we're going to get single sign-on to the Mapping app and the Messenger app. So the user will click on the Cockpit app, and they'll be prompted to sign in here. Because we have multiple identities that we're using with this system, we want to tell the system which credential we want to actually authenticate which and uh, which identity provider we want to be coming from. Um, you're going to see here we have in our lab environment just a Motorola Solutions um, email address or identity set up. Um, ideally, in a real world scenario, this is where you would type in like John. Doe at NYPD or LAPD or um, Harris County Fire, something like that. This is where they would use their own home organization's uh, uh, identity and credentials to get into this system. So once that happens, the user is prompted for a FIDO authentication. So in this case, this is going to be the FIDO UAF with the fingerprint and the private key. They will click OK to use their FIDO credential. They are now prompted to put their fingerprint on the sensor. Um, we don't have this in the video, uh, but at this point in time, the regular fingerprint sensor that's on your Android, whether it's like a, a Pixel or a Galaxy device or on your iPhone, that's the same sensor you would use. Um, and the fingerprint must be pre-registered prior to this step. So if, you, if the 
public safety first responder individual is already using that fingerprint sensor and it's already registered, they don't really have to do anything in that sense. Um, they don't have to register the fingerprint to the device. Um, if they haven't registered a fingerprint, they'll need to do that before this step. And at this point in time, once they've placed their fingerprint, they are now authenticated. So what happened there is the fingerprint was one factor that was, uh, that was validated, and then uh, the private key on the device was um, unlocked and a challenge happened with the server to provide the second factor of authentication. And you can see how, you can see now that right at the top, it says the uh, NC3 test user is now logged into Cockpit. So the individual will now close out the Cockpit app and open the mapping app. And the, the user is now already authenticated to this mapping app. So there was no authentication required for this at all. Um, you can see that their location is in the, here in the Washington DC area. Um, and you can also see one other user who's logged in um, down in the Charlotte area. And I think a little screen will pop up and you can say, oh look, that's NCCOE test one. That's the other user that's logged into the system uh, already. So they are already authenticated to the mapping app. I'll we'll close that out. They'll open up the Messenger app, and voila, they're already authenticated to the Messenger app as well. So there's no additional authentication required there. Um, I don't want to get um, too incredibly technical uh, unless you know we can talk more on the questions side. But um, basically, what's happening here is rather than authentication occurring, there is an exchange of tokens happening on the back end of this system. And so each time the uh, these apps, uh, the user clicks on one of these new apps. On the back end, that application server is checking to see if that user is already authenticated, seeing that they did log in already with that FIDO authentication, and then each app is just given a token um, rather than having the user re-authenticate, and all of that is um, opaque to the user. Um, so that was a FIDO UAF authentication. I will um, now switch over, You'll, it'll look very similar here. This is a FIDO U2F authentication. Uh, this is the same device, the same Android device here. Um, so you'll see some similarities between these two demos. Again, they click on the cockpit app and they click to sign in. Uh, one difference here is you'll notice that the uh, domain is different. They're not actually using a Motorola Solutions uh, uh, identity. They're going to, excuse me, they're going to use a uh, identity here that's inside of our lab at the NCCOE. Again, this would be something like an LAPD or an NYPD credential they'd be using here. Um, at this point, the user now goes into the U2F authentication flow. Um, so as I mentioned before, the U2F is a combination of something you know, like a PIN or a password, and then the external hardware authenticator. So in this case, we're going to demonstrate a quick password. So the user will type in their password, their username and password, excuse me. And then once they've done that, they will be prompted to uh, enter the U2F authentication. So they click on authenticate. At this point in time, the device is saying, please touch your external authenticator to the back of your phone where the NFC, the near field communication radio is. Um, so I can't show you this right now uh, in, with this demo, but um, you know you would take your little hardware external um, token that would, let's say, uh, already be attached to your body and or is right on your keychain, and you would just tap it to the back where the NFC radio is on the device. Um, and once that occurs, the user will then be authenticated. So as you can see right there, we're now back into the cockpit app and we're automatically authenticated. This time as a different user, NCCUE test four. Um, and the same type of single sign-on functionality exists. We go into the mapping app and get access to the, to the mapping features here, and then um, you can see NCCUE test four is logged into the map, and you close that out, um, go into the messenger app, uh, and you are now into the messaging um, part of the application as well. So this is just a quick demonstration of single sign-on um, with uh, one initial app we're using with, for authentication and then two other subsequent apps. Um, and this would work for any number of applications that you wanted to integrate into this architecture. Um, so if you authenticated once, you could then get into two, four, six, eight, ten other applications on the device without needing to authenticate. So going back to my slide deck, um, I quickly want to run down a few of the benefits um, of this solution. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, if you recall those challenges we were really trying to tackle, one of the benefits of this is we're really trying to reduce the amount of time that public safety personnel spend 
authenticating in the number of attempts they, they have to authenticate uh, throughout the day, right? We, I already sort of uh, uh, talked about how time is of the essence in this community, and so we want to make sure that the minimum the minim amount of time is really spent on authenticating and the maximum amount of time is spent on public safety first responders doing their job. Um, uh, secondarily here, we want to reduce the number of credentials that both the personnel and the organization needs to manage. You'll notice that in the demo, you can get access to multiple applications and you're using one credential. So you're managing one credential. The individual has to remember one username and password. Um, they have one additional uh, factor and um, they will input that once a day, right? And uh, whatever whatever the organization already has for, for whether it's LAPD or NYPD or um, you know Harris County Fire, whatever it is, um, that initial uh, identity management solution can be leveraged within this architecture. Uh, we want to increase interoperability, right? One of the biggest benefits of using standards um, is that they're interoperable. So as public safety first responders uh, adopt mobile platforms and adopt mobile applications that support their line of duty, um, we want to make sure that the interoperability is there. Uh, we don't talk about it a lot in this particular uh, build because it's really sort of out of scope, but um, we have with this architecture set up identity federation. And so this architecture fully supports things like cross county or cross state or cross jurisdictional information sharing and the sharing of identities and the sharing of those strong multi-factor authentications of the users. Um, and that's not possible unless you really have um, standards-based solutions um, and you get that interoperability as a big um, positive externality. Uh, and then, as Jeremy talked about, we love the authenticator flexibility that comes with the FIDO ecosystem, right? So uh, when Jeremy was talking about FIDO, you know, the standards part of it, the good, strong, secure security um, part of it is, hey, let's, let's make sure people are using that um, public-private key pairs to do this authentication, right? Um, but when it comes to authenticators, whether it's an external hardware authenticator or some form of biometrics, the market competes on that. And so um, if we, you know, we showed a couple implementations of, of a biometric and a hardware, um, but if that doesn't work for a given set of requirements for a public safety organization, they can go to the FIDO Weekend system, they can see all the vendors that are there, and they can um, have an array of authenticators to choose from that might better meet their needs. Uh, one of the primary benefits uh, that uh, FIDO brings to the table in addition to um, the security benefits, which I'll hop to right now. Uh, so obviously, uh, multi-factor authentication is a big benefit here. Um, we uh, will, in our NIST guidance, be talking about how our solution and how the FIDO solution maps into NIST 863 version 3 requirements. Um, if you're familiar with that document, you know there's a section on authenticator assurance levels, um, and uh, we are mapping into those requirements there. So you, that's one security benefit you got out of the box. Another with FIDO is that uh, there's really no secrets that are stored server side. So um, if you were following along with the demo, you probably thought, man, you know, public key or the private keys are pretty critical in this build. So are the uh, biometric templates in this build. Um, all of those things are um, stored uh, on the device or on an external hardware um, uh, token. So in the case of the UAF uh, authentication, we have a biometric template that stays in the secure element on the device. Uh, on the mobile device, we have a um, private key that stays on that mobile device it is never transported across the wire to a backend server. And then in the UAS uh, portion, we have a, uh, a private key that stays on that little token that we were showing you, right? So it never leaves there. Um, and then lastly here is uh, the phishing resistance, right? Uh, Jeremy talked about how, I think he said 60 some percent of passwords are phished. That's a really big uh, attack surface when it comes to passwords. And so it's one of the primary benefits that FIDO uh, has in, you know, Jeremy talked about, and it's one of the primary benefits that we want to bring to uh, public safety first responder communities. Uh, for the single sign-on piece, as I mentioned, we use an IETF best current practice uh, standard for single sign-on uh, that was just ratified, I think, in August of this year. So this is a this is a new uh, a new standard, and uh, one of the primary benefits of that standard is that you do not need to give username and passwords uh, to a SaaS application or to a mobile backend, right? I talked before about, oh man, it's really difficult for developers to roll their own solutions and to uh, come up with ways of storing credentials. Well, uh, we wanna 
we want to use this standard because it gets us away from that um, and moves us to that token-based system that I talked about. So um, in the authentication that you saw, the only time, um, a, the only username and password credentials are validated right at the identity provider with that Active Directory and never given to the mobile AppWords backend. Um, in addition, the, uh, as I said, the system is completely token-based, and uh, one benefit of the token-based systems is they come with limited scopes of authorization that can be set with policy. So you can make sure that the mobile app that um, is accessing information only gets access to the back-end back systems that they're allowed to access. Uh, and then one of the generic benefits of single sign-on is just reducing the number of credentials um, and decreasing the risk of credential reuse, right? Um, I've touched on that a couple times now. I don't think I need to go into any more detail there. Um, so we do have some next steps for this build that I want to talk with everybody about quickly. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we, are, we just showed you an Android demonstration. We are implementing an iOS demonstration. Uh, so we are getting this architecture up and running on, um, on Apple iPhone devices uh, and potentially on a iPad device. It would work just as easily there. Um, one of the challenges with the Apple demonstration is that uh, some of the Apple single sign-on capabilities have actually changed. So I mentioned we're using the latest and greatest technology in this build. Actually, in the middle of the build, uh, between Apple iOS 10 and 11, uh, some, of the, some of the finer details changed. And so the standard had to adapt a little bit, and that has happened. And now this architecture works flawlessly on iOS 11, um, as it does on iOS uh, 8, 9, and 10, as I mentioned before. Uh, and we are also looking at um, devices uh, or shared device scenarios. So one of the assumptions of the demonstration you just saw was that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the user and the device and the data access. Um, and that is largely true for, uh, for law enforcement and largely true for uh, fire entities, but it may not be quite as true for some other um, subsectors of public safety like uh, emergency response. And so um, if you need to be able to log out quickly and then have, hand that device to someone else and then have them log in quickly. Um, we're looking at that scenario as well and what, what may be the requirements for those use cases. Um, as I mentioned, we publish uh, uh, practice guides. And so uh, our guidance is uh, about to come out for public comment, our draft guidance. So SP1800-X, um, it says here, we haven't received an official number yet, but it'll likely be something like 1800-14 uh, like or 15. And uh, we're looking to release that in mid-January. So uh, if you are interested in following us, you can go to uh, the NIST Computer Security Research page and sign up for notifications there. You can go to the NCCE site and sign up for notifications there. You can go to the individual project page for this project and get notifications there, all of which will tell you when this document goes live and out for public comment. Um, and again, that will include the, all the technical decisions and the trade-offs and lessons learned um, that we took away and, uh, when we actually uh, built out this architecture. So if uh, you just saw FIDO and you just saw SSO and um, you, know, you want to implement just FIDO or you want to implement just SSO, um, you can go to this guidance, which will show you how to implement both, and you can implement both or you can implement one or the other. Um, either way, it should be a, a really good resource for any individual looking at this particular uh, space for uh, mobile application sign-on. Uh, and so with that, I will go uh, and leave things uh, open for questions. Hey, thanks, Bill. This is Jeremy Grant again. So for those of you who are on the phone, I see we've got well over 100 people participating. Uh, there is a questions tab. Uh, in uh, the control panel for the webinar. Uh, note that we're not able to take uh, spoken questions the way we're set up. Uh, only Bill and I uh, can actually speak. But if you type your question into the questions tab, uh, I'll be able to ask it uh, to Bill or I'll answer it myself. Uh, I have a few actually that, that I had for Bill, but we have one uh, that came out initially, which is focusing on the iOS environment. And the question yeah. was, how are auth tokens exchanged between apps on iOS, which sandboxes apps and prevents data from being shared uh, inter-application? Yep. yep. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I apologize if I'm going to get tech, uh, a bit technical here. Um, uh, basically, the technology that originally came out uh, in iOS 8 is called a uh, Safari, the Safari Web Viewer. And so what this was is a uh, instance of a web browser that is instantiated by, um, by the iOS operating system via an API call from the app. And so the way this used to be done 
is that the application developer would have to actually code in a sort of mock browser to present to the user. Um, we wanted to get away from the, the, the application to, or the, excuse me, Apple and Android uh, wanted to get away from that. So the original technology had, um, had it occurring that way. Um, and so that, that uh, Safari view controller or, or in Chrome on, on Android, it's called the Chrome custom tab, could actually share authentication state between applications. Um, on the iOS uh, side, the thing that changed between iOS 10 and iOS 11 is actually they got rid of the ability to do that with the Chrome custom tabs um, and then actually put in a whole new API um, to handle that scenario and to share that information across applications. So if you go into the Apple iOS developer notes, it's called the SF Authentication API, um, and that is the, the, the new standard way of uh, sharing that authentication context um, and those tokens between um, apps. Now, I will say this. When it comes to the tokens, um, each time a mobile application is clicked on by the user and makes a request of the back end, um, they are given an individual access token. So there's no sharing of access tokens or refresh tokens for those access tokens um, among, uh, among applications. Uh, and if you delve into the standard, um, we're also on top of that using uh, another IETF uh, best current practice called Pixie, um, proof key for code exchange. And um, each of those access tokens are actually cryptographically challenged to make sure that they can only be used by the app they were issued to um, each time they're trying to be used. So um, the authentication state and the shared uh, I, uh, authentication that occurred, the session that exists can be shared, but the tokens themselves, and a new one is issued to each application, um, and then a, and a subsequent time to live is given to those tokens um, for each new application. So they're not shared amongst apps. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, next question, actually I actually had a couple around this. Uh, we're looking at uh, the idea of shared devices, understanding that you might have yeah. uh, a device which you know is used by a few different people, and if you're yeah. enrolling biometrics, uh, you know, the question I saw was, you know, devices typically allow you to store to record five to 10 fingerprints. Uh, yep. How do you deal with a shared device here, and how does that work? Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question that I don't have a um, exact answer to. It's one of the reasons that we are looking at the shared device um, space. Um, you know, one thing that I am sort of questioning in that space is um, not only does there need to be a use case for shared devices, but there needs to be access to data that's of such a sensitivity level that there needs to be that one-to-one -one mapping of um, user to access. And so we are looking for good use cases um, in that sense. Um, so from a fingerprint perspective, or a biometric perspective, you do need to actually have the, the biometric registered with that device. And so if you wanted multiple individuals to be able to use that device, they would all need to have their, their biometric template registered with that device to be able to use it. Um, and so uh, that would be um, subject to the limitations of the platform itself. I don't know the exact number, whether it's five or 10, um, let's say fingerprints that you can register, but you would be subject to that limitation. Um, there is some creative stuff you can do on like Android, for instance, where if you have a kiosk device scenario, you could, uh, for instance, have a, a user check out a device at the beginning of their shift, register their fingerprint, which is a very simple process, use that device for their entire shift, and then when they check it back in and they log out, you can use um, some automated processes on Android to sort of wipe that profile away and make it a new default device so that when the next user um, comes and picks it up, you know, the, the police officer number two starts his shift, uh, that device can be used. Now that does not handle the, hey, I just have to hand the device to the uh, person next to me at the scene of the crime, for instance. Um, but in some of those cases, uh, this is again where some of the FIDO uh, authenticators shine. Right? If you're using a, uh, a YubiKey or, or any FIDO U2F external authenticator, that key actually gets registered with the backend server. And so uh, you could actually just present that key to that device 
and um, without having to have it pre-registered and authenticate right then and there. And then you could hand that to the person next to you uh, after you log out and they could then present their key. And um, so long as it's registered with the backend server, which probably is because they have their own device likely and they've gained access, um, that they can also authenticate. So, um, you know, that type of discussion, those types of questions are the types of uh, ways we want people to think about their requirements and looking at authentication. And one of the big benefits of, uh, of the FIDO diversity uh, in, in the FIDO ecosystem. Good. It's, you know, as you were talking, there were three or four people popping up in the question section saying, hey, she mentioned the U2F use case for shared devices. And then, and then you yep. did. Yep. So, yeah, um, exactly right. Yeah. I've had a couple of questioners ask specifically uh, if they'll be able to get access to today's presentations, and the answer is yes. After this call, uh, both an archive of this webinar as well as the presentation will should be available on uh, the FIDO website. Um, another question that came up, a lot of focus on iOS and Android. Somebody said, will this be available to devices like Microsoft Surface or other Windows-based devices? Uh, there is a good chance it's going to happen. Um, I have uh, not really kept tabs on the latest that's going on in the Microsoft space. Um, I have an understanding of, of two different things that are happening. One is um, Microsoft adopting the IETF best current practice for uh, single sign-on. Uh, and my understanding is that is happening. Um, it may even be available in the latest uh, version of, of Windows operating systems. I'm not quite sure on that, so don't quote me. Um, and then the other sort of shoe to fall is the uh, is the FIDO 2.0 spec. So the the FIDO um, uh, specs that we showed you here are the original, uh, I believe, 1.1 specs. Um, FIDO is moving to 2.0, and uh, Windows plans to support FIDO 2.0 um, out of the box, is my understanding. And so at that point in time, the same type of architecture would be possible on um, on Windows devices. Uh, we have not looked that closely at that space, not uh, not as any slant to Windows, but um, mostly because uh, you know we have not seen a lot of public safety adoption of Windows platforms, and so we were trying to tackle the the platforms that we thought were the biggest bang for buck for this community. Um, if there was interest in that space from public safety, we'd be happy to look at that space as well and and stand up a demonstration. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's worth noting when Windows uh, when Microsoft announced Windows Hello. Uh, Correct. Uh, as part of Windows 10, they announced that they were building it off of the FIDO standards, and so um, yep. there, there should be some applicability uh, there. Um, another question that came, uh, can this be used to achieve single sign-on between mobile apps and mobile web? Yes, correct. So um, that's the beauty of this IETF um, uh, best current practice is that if you're just accessing a application through a mobile web browser, so instead of clicking on an app, you click on your, your Safari or your Chrome web browser, um, this applies just the same. Um, it just so happens that we didn't have, um, Mo Motorola didn't have at the time we set up this demo, an actual web app that implemented the standard that we could use to demo this, um, but completely works on, on web apps as well, and the, and the flows are almost identical. Great. Hey, uh, going back to the demo, somebody had a question. What happens if a first responder user, uh, I think this was you know, for the, uh, uh, the UAF scenario, what if you turn off auto lock on your device after you authenticate to PSX cockpit? What happens there? Uh, correct. So that's a, that's a wonderful question. So this does not, uh, this architecture does not replace the need for that uh, local authentication, right? Um, so with any single sign-on scenario, you are still going to be subject to um, making sure that device has a base level of protection with that um, initial authentication. Um, if, you, if, the, if the user is given the ability to never locally authenticate to the device, then one option that the uh, actual um, public safety organization can take or the actual uh, service provider for the mobile services can take is really make the, uh, the time to live for the access tokens um, smaller. So you can say, um, for instance, uh, hey, uh, I only want this token given to this app to live for, uh, for one hour, and then after one hour, the user would have to re-authenticate. Um, and you could make that as small as you wanted. If you wanted to do it after 15 minutes, you could do something like that. Um, another, another potential option, um, and this is a little bit more of an attractive option, at least in the U2F scenario, is that 
Um, one of the things that you can do is you can break down the session at the authorization server, but leave the session up at the actual IDP. And so in that case, um, you would actually get an option to do something like keep the, u keep the user's password uh, session um, uh, running so they don't have to put in their password. But let's say like after 15 minutes of inactivity, uh, have them re tap their actual FIDO U2F authenticator to the back of the device and have that single factor be presented um, combined then with the initial authentication that was already done for the password to, uh, to revalidate that user, re-authenticate that user. Um, so the architecture really is flexible. Um, uh, I just didn't want to get into all those details because uh, it does get a bit technical um, and I don't know, that's not really for everybody. So one question though on that. So the special publication, which is coming out soon, perhaps an early Christmas present. Well, for those who, who love these <laughs> special publications for Christmas, like me, yeah. um, will will you get into some of these variables? Because it sounds like you know, there, there are a number of different ways that you, look, you've had yeah. an open and flexible architecture, but depending yeah. on use cases or particular requirements, there may be specific uh, uh, additional guidance that's going to be needed to to make this all work. Yeah, correct. So we have been looking at things like um, 863, uh, uh, NIST 863, which establishes some of these parameters. Uh, we we're looking at things like CGIS policy and, and um, the authentication requirements they have there in terms of you know time to live for tokens and all that type of stuff. And we are um, showing the flexibility of the architecture and talking about how we can meet some of those requirements in the practice guide. Um, uh, that said, if, uh, if there is content that is, uh, would be relevant and is not in the practice guide, um, you know, we are, you, any individual is always one degree of separation from me. So if you go to, I mean, you'll get my, my personal email address for NIST here uh, in a second on this, on this last slide, but if you go to our project page, um, any email on the public safety projects page will go to my inbox and we are happy to sit down on a call and talk with about talk with you about how you could implement this architecture and the types of um, various requirements it could meet. Um, so we can't obviously cover every corner case in the practice guide. Um, we're mostly trying to demonstrate the flexibility and, and say that it's possible. And then, um, you know, for, for some of these corner cases, we'll, we're happy to engage one on one. That's great. NIST, by the way, once again, proving they are the, the best bang for your tax dollar uh, tax dollar buck. <laughs> Right. So a uh, couple more questions. We're almost out of time. Um, one uh, was, uh, could you talk a little bit about the potential here uh, for using, uh, I, I guess, the guidance that will be coming out in this special publication with wearables and other IoT devices? Oh, man, isn't that a loaded question? Um, uh, I, I will um, not talk too in-depth about that, um, but, I, but I will say this. Um, there has been a lot of push in the IoT space to uh, look at how token-based authentication mechanisms can apply in the IoT space. Um, and there's even some implementations of it um, out there. Um, I personally have not seen the IoT authentication space go in one particular direction yet, um, but I uh, also happen to sit on the, um, on the ITL uh, IoT team for NIST, uh, and if you want to talk a little bit more about that in person, um, come see me at the con uh, Consumer Electronics Show in January, where I will be uh, at the Public Safety Communications Research booth, talking all both about single sign-on and also about um, uh, IoT challenges and uh, some of the work that we're doing in that space. Um, but I do, I am personally of the belief that there are some really strong use cases for token-based authentication within IoT. Um, and we are looking at, tr the entire industry is looking at trans, um, uh, taking the standards that exist and moving them into that space. Great. Hey, Bill, I think we're at the two o'clock hour. So if you had one more slide you wanted to show that had uh, that contact information. Yep. Um, there were a couple other yep. questions we had that they were getting uh, into some, some pretty deep uh, technical issues. Uh, so sure. I, I'll ask folks, if you didn't get a question today, please reach out to Bill or reach out to me. I'm at jeremy.grant at venable.com. And uh, Tasha, any, uh, any wrap up remarks? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeremy and Bill. And thanks everyone for joining us on today's webinar. Um, we hope that you found it insightful and valuable. Again, the slides and a recording of the presentation will be available shortly on the phytoalliance.org website. Uh, please take a moment to complete the survey that will be at the end of this webinar to let us know 
what you thought. And also be sure to keep in touch with Fido on Twitter and LinkedIn. We look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you.